Yeah, so in this video, I want to now talk about this iterative training algorithm that I mentioned in the previous video. So we were talking about training a linear regression using an iterative algorithm. This is also the first part. Uh, we will come back to that later on when we talk about gradient descent. So here I just want to give the general outline. So one way we can use an iterative algorithm to fit least squares linear regression models is by using brute force. So this would be what I call or think of as a very naive way to fit a linear regression model or any type of neural network. So what we can do is we can start by initializing parameters to all zeros, so the weights and the bias, or small random numbers. And then we have a for loop here for k rounds. So let me use a different color for that. So for k rounds, we can then choose another random set of weights. And then, yeah, we look at the predictions of the linear regression model. And now, if the model performs better, we keep those weights. And then, yeah, we go back here. So this is like an iteration, k times. Every time we find better ways, we keep those. Uh, if the weights are worse, so if the model with the weights performs worse, we actually discard them. So we only keep the weights if they are actually better than before. And yeah, if you do that many, many, many times, this approach is actually guaranteed to find the optimal solution, right? Because yeah, you do this many, many, many times. And if the model can only improve, eventually, just by luck, you will find a yeah, great set of weights, the optimal weights. But as you can think, or as you can imagine, this would be a very, very inefficient and terribly slow way of fitting a linear regression model. So I would not recommend doing this in practice, although in practice it works, it's, it's not a good way to fit a linear regression model. Yeah, so luckily there is a better way for fitting a linear regression model iteratively. So what we can do is we can analyze what effect of change a parameter has on the predictive performance of the model. So we can take a look at the squared error loss and see when we change the weight and the bias in a certain way, how it affects these um, yeah, errors. And then we can make a small change. So we can change the weight and bias a little bit in the direction that improves the performance. So if we understand the relationship between the weight and the loss, we can change the weight such that the loss goes down. So we have a smaller error. And uh, we can then do this several times in small steps until the loss is not further decreasing. So one by one, we will change the weight such that the loss decreases. It turns out that this is actually yeah, the, the online mode that we talked about, uh, yeah, just written a little bit differently. So on the left hand side, we have again the online mo mode for the perceptron learning rule. So where we iterate over the training epochs. And then for every training example, we compute uh, yeah, the prediction, compute the error, and then do the update here. So for linear regression, there's an algorithm called stochastic gradient descent. So stochastic gradient descent is the analog of the perceptron learning rule for um, yeah, convex loss functions here. We can also use it for non-convex uh, loss functions for neural networks. That will be something we will cover in the next lecture. So here we will focus on uh, the linear regression model and then at the end of this lecture also at, uh, on the adaptive linear neuron. So what is uh, similar and what is different? So again, uh, so we have the same weight initialization here. Let me use a different color for things that are the same. So weight initialization is the same. We also iterate over the training epochs. Then we also iterate over the training examples in a data set. We also compute the predictions the same way because yeah, like I mentioned in the previous video, the perceptron and the linear regression model, they both compute the net input here, except here we have the threshold function in the perceptron. And let me use red here, that would be the threshold function in the case of the perceptron. And here this would be an identity function. And this is the um, threshold. And yeah, inside here, this is the net input. This is, oops. Uh, I don't know what it is with curly brackets, but I can't draw curly brackets. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, Z, the net inputs, um, they are computed exactly the same way. This function is an identity function in the case of linear regression and a threshold function in the case of the perceptron. Now, um, 
for the perceptron, we compute this, this error here by just subtracting the predicted value from the actual class label. In linear regression, we have continuous values, but it's very similar. So also here, we have a subtraction for the weights. We multiply this by x, by the input feature vector, and for the bias unit, we don't. So if you're wondering what these symbols here mean, so this uh, Nabla symbol, this stands for the gradient. So here we are computing the gradient of the loss, or the gradient of the loss L, this curly L, L here, with respect to the weights here. So this is the gradient of, well, let me spell this out, gradient of the loss function with respect to the whoops weights and then here at the bottom this is the same also also the gradient of the loss with respect to the bias unit here or derivative so um yeah so you can see um, this is yeah, closely related to what's going on in the perceptron. And in step C now, we do the update. So the update is a little bit different here. So on the left-hand side here, we have the current weight, and then we multiply the error with the feature vector. Uh, we don't do this on the right hand side we have done something like uh, multiplying with the feature vector up here but here now what we do is we we add another term here and this term eta is a scalar it's a um, we are scaling something and this is the so-called learning rate so let's call that the learning rate it's just a scaling term and in the parentheses here this is the negative gradient. So I, yeah, I also wrote it down here. So we have the negative gradient. We now update the parameters by the negative gradient. So it's, it's kind of similar to what's going on in the perceptron, except that the way we get this gradient is based on calculus. And um, in the next couple of videos, I will yeah, give you a brief calculus refresher to explain where this comes from. So here we are really yeah, computing the negative gradient of the squared error loss with respect to the weights and the bias. And on the in the perceptron case, this is it looks very similar. It's a little bit different because it's not depending on calculus. Here we have the threshold function, and um, depending on how yeah. Um, fresh your calculus skills are you know that for yeah, um, non-smooth functions like threshold functions we can't compute derivatives so in that way it's somewhat related um, and very similar but there's a little little detail okay so um, yeah uh, one more slide i just see i have here so on the left hand side we or i showed you um vectorized implementation of this linear regression online mode so where we had vectors so x here is a vector for example and um, the gradient uh, is a vector but we can also kind of um, yeah, unroll this using a for loop so this way we don't uh, yeah, need gradients we can just talk about partial derivatives so um, in order to yeah, simplify this as a for loop we would just look at one feature at a time or one weight at a time so if we have a data set where our dimensionality of the inputs is m, so we have m features, what we can do is then for each uh, weight, so the number of weights is equal to the features, right? Because if I have um, my inputs at like x1, x2, x3, then here they go into my net input function, and each input is associated with a weight, right? So I'm not drawing the bias here, but uh, yeah, each input is associated with a weight. So we have m weights, and I can for each weight separately compute the partial derivative of the loss with respect to that weight. So it's an analog of this one here, not using any linear algebra now, just using partial derivatives in tem uh, instead of gradients. And then I can do also the update the same way. So here, this is just the for loop version. I think. Um, yeah, this is maybe conceptually a bit easier because partial derivatives are maybe easier to think about as uh, compared to gradients. I mean, it's the same thing, but 
Uh, instead of yeah talking about gradients, we could also talk about partial derivatives. However, like I explained in the previous lecture, vectorized implementations are faster, which is why we usually yeah, use gradients and uh, vector-based implementations. Um, so the learning rule from the previous slide now is called stochastic gradient descent. Um, I was showing you this learning rule, but I didn't show you where this learning rule came from. So where, how did I derive this learning rule? So in order to understand that, uh, yeah, there's some little calculus required. I think most of you already took calculus classes because that was a prerequisite for this class. If you are a little bit rusty, I have two bonus videos I will be recording after this video. So you can maybe refresh your calculus skills, but it's not necessary. So you can also jump ahead to this video where I will explain where the learning rule comes from. And if you like, you can watch these two videos where I go over some of the calculus concepts.